So in the book of Daniel, there's this episode where uh, the other officials of uh, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, they're, they're jealous of, of David and his place within the court. And they realize that he's a Jew, so they set him up. And they say to King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, make a decree that everyone has to worship you and only you as a god. Well, David being this devout Jew, he's not going to follow that. And he, three times a day, he goes into his house, faces east towards Jerusalem, and bows and prays to, uh, to Yahweh, the God of heaven. The, and so then they, they, you know, they catch him in the act, and uh, they take him, and, and uh, he, God saves him from his punishment. But the point I wanted to make is that, that here is an example of a faithful Jew praying three times a day. And that's just the standard, you know, of what they had to pray. So the disciples of Jesus, they already know how to pray. They're faithful Jews. They pray, they get up in the morning, they thank God for a new day, they, they pray uh, in the afternoon, and then they pray before they go to bed. It's just standard. And then also they say grace whenever they happen to eat a meal. On a, on a side note, Lydia and I, we pray differently when it comes to mealtime. That, that I pray this transcendent prayer. It's and it's a group prayer. Lord, thank you for this food which you're about to receive. Bless it to the nourishment of our bodies and bless all the hands prepared it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Lydia, on the other hand, she prays as if Jesus is sitting in the seat right next to us. And so she has this little conversation with Jesus, you know, thanking him for the food and all that. And then she says, well, I'll talk to you later. You know, thanks. And that's... <laughs> She's not here today, so I thought maybe even if she was here, I'd pick on her, but at least I don't have to look at her glaring at me. <laughs> so, you know, we may have in ourselves these rote prayers. You know, we might pray in the morning, we might pray at bedtime, we might pray over meals and those kinds of things. But how do we go beyond the, that, that, the spiritual discipline of those rote prayers how do we go use prayer to go deeper in our relationship with Jesus Christ? Uh, this disciple, which we don't know which one it was, goes to Jesus and says, teach us how to pray like John taught his disciples how to pray. But we, we're not told how John taught his disciples how to pray. But John being this radical prophet of Jesus, he's probably teaching them, you know, to pray for justice and peace and uh, to, you know, praying against the enemies of those who are oppressors. In the ancient world, it was not uncommon for there to be misuse of prayer, or they probably thought it was, you know, a normal way to pray. And of course they, you know, uh, not the people of the uh, uh, Jews and Israel, but because they kind of prayed to one God most of the time. But others uh, in the ancient world, they prayed to gods and they tried to bribe the gods. That they tried to pray to for their God's grace or the grace of their different gods to get something in return. That if you, you know, if you please the gods, the gods will give you whatever you want. So they would, uh, like I said, they would uh, bribe gods for blessings, and a lot of their, they would give sacrifices of animals and incense and all kinds of things just to, to keep on God's good graces and to ask for God for things. I can't help but uh, remember uh, Christmas in July, so we're going to do Christmas in July, and in the Christmas story, uh, and uh, Ralphie with the wanting the BB gun. And it's time for, it's Christmas time, and obviously uh, it's just before Christmas break, and it's tradition that they bring presents to the teacher. 
and all the other kids are bringing an apple or they're bringing some small and of course if you've seen the new Ralph he shows up with this massive fruit basket and so he's trying to bribe the teacher you know for good graces now this may be a childish idea and we can laugh at something like that but as adults we sometimes can do the same thing that I remember uh, somebody uh, who confided in me and a friend who he was going through some marital problems and uh, he said you know my wife is trying to get this particular job and I think if she can get this job and this stable job that that you know it might save our marriage and and, and then he says I have been praying harder than my in my entire life for her to get this job and and of course, then, you know, every bone in my body was saying, that's not how you pray. <laughs> but we all do it. Of course, she didn't get the job and, and things didn't work out. Uh, but um, it, that we have this mindset that, that God will, will give us this if we pray this. Or if we do this, God will give us that. But Jesus doesn't dismiss this relationship between God's benevolence and, and what our wants are. But Jesus says, um, no, those are all mixed up. <laughs> Jesus says, no, he, he, he uses the example of the Lord's Prayer. He teaches them the Lord's Prayer. And he says, God has always blessed us with more than we could ever ask or imagine. And that's actually in a prayer for a morning prayer. But he says, seek our blessings from God and don't bargain with God. We don't have anything God really wants or needs. We can't, you know, we can't say, God, I'll give you this if you give me that. Because God doesn't need anything. Uh, I like, in, in a seminary, I studied Tillich. And one thing I remember from Paul Tillich is that, that God, has, God has glory. And if we say, we're going to give glory to God, God, God doesn't need glory. God's got all the glory. You know, we, we need to, to recognize and celebrate God's glory, not think that we're going to give God more glory, and in return, God's going to give us something, something back, glory of our own that we want. As children, we say, when somebody gives us something, we're taught that we're so supposed to say, please and thank you. And we should say that to God as well, please and thank you, when God gives us something. But, like I said, the disciples, they already know how to pray, but Jesus goes beyond that. I like, what I really like about this gospel reading is at the very end, when Jesus says, ask God for what, uh, for whatever, and God will give you the Holy Spirit. And, and that, that reminds me that the Holy Spirit, you know, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the advocate and the guide. And in the, the Paul's letter to the Romans, he says that we don't know how to pray. That is the Holy Spirit that prays through us toward God. And I like that because it's not us that prays, it's the Holy Spirit that prays to us. And the Holy Spirit is, uh, is wisdom. So what we really should be praying for is not for God to give us things that we want or things that even the things that we need, but to ask for God, for the Holy Spirit, for the wisdom to know the difference between what we want and what we really need. And to recognize and bless God for the things that we already have. It, Lydia and I, we spent yesterday um, going through thrift shops. And we were trying to find some stuff, over, little stuff over for the house next door to equip it. And just going through thrifts, you know, Goodwill stores and that, and seeing what, what they're full of, the things that people have donated, Makes made us just so aware of how blessed we are as a nation 
that we have all of this stuff that we, we can either exchange this used stuff for new stuff or we can just have so much stuff and then we were, as we were coming home, uh, we, Lydia happened to look over and over by Coles. They're building this new storage facility. And Lydia then again, she says, isn't it amazing that we have to build all of these storage places for the things that we can't fit into our house? Now, granted, there are times when we might be in transition from one place to another and, and we need you know, temporary space. But there are people that have those things for years and have stuff in them that they don't, they probably don't even know what's in them anymore. And we were guilty of that, that uh, when we first came down here, that uh, Lydia's mother had been the repository of every ancestor's thing. And it took three U-Haul, the biggest U-Haul trucks that you could rent to bring all of that stuff down here when we moved down. And all of that got put in, when the first uh, moved down, we all had the house over on Tanglewood, and we shipped the stuff that thing full. But then we had to temporarily put it into storage while we were finding space in our new house over in Locust Street and building this massive garage <laughs> so we could put that stuff in it. And it took Lydia practically 10 years to go through all of that stuff and decide what to do with it. But so it's important to us to keep in mind to, that we need to pray for the Holy Spirit to help us to build that deeper relationship with Jesus Christ and to say, God, what is your will? What do you want from us? Not so much to say, God, here's what I want. Give it to me. Because that's being a 